everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I am going to be going in depth into some of my top tips to help amateur writers level up their writing and improve their craft. Specifically, I'm going to go all in on five key areas where I see a lot of writers who I would call 201 writers. They're past 101, they've written a novel, they've maybe even written a few, revised a few, tried querying, but something still isn't clicking. I've done the fun listicles in the past of top novice writing mistakes, and I actually was going to do an update to the one I made almost three years ago, and I still probably will, because they're a lot of fun, and until you hear something as a potential pitfall of an amateur writer, it might not occur to you. But developing those outlines, I kept wanting to come up with tons of really good examples and advice for, well, how do you actually fix those mistakes? And hence, I am making this video. I singled out the five that I see over and over and over again through critique partnering and mentorship that aren't exactly easy to fix. None of this is easy, but there are actionable steps you can take to work on any of these five things if you do these five things. But I'll say very often what I see in writers where it's just not clicking is that they're not just doing one or two of these things. They're doing multiple of them or all of them. They're common pitfalls for amateur writers for a reason. I will have timestamps down below so that you can jump around to the sections that are going to serve you the most, especially because this is probably going to be a semi-long one because I do want to dig in on each of these and be as helpful as I can. But even there, I know I'm going to miss things and this can't possibly be definitive. So I just hope that this helps as a good jumping off point for anyone who is struggling with these things. And just to give you a sneak peek, the five things I'm going to be covering are dialogue, scenes, tags, etc., scene, function, and filler, writing a lot while communicating very little, overwriting, but a very particular kind of overwriting, ineffective writing, we'll call it, repetitive and kind of basic sentence style and writing style, and the fifth one, the big one, the frustrating one is telling, probably the number one thing that I see amateur writers falling into, and some of the other four are aspects of telling. But yeah, I'm going to go all in on telling some things that you can look for and how to fix it. In my experience, wall-to-wall -wall telling is the number one thing that holds back amateur writers. All right, are we ready to jump in? So starting off with dialogue. This is a catch-all category because what I find tends to fall under issues that people have with dialogue, it's either their dialogue first writers where they're actually good at dialogue and they're comfortable with dialogue. I definitely started off as that kind of writer myself and so there's just walls of text, of dialogue, of characters talking, and very little to anchor it, which can be a contributing factor to white room syndrome, as well as the issue of overwriting, but overwriting as it relates to dialogue scenes. English teachers love to say said is dead, but in professional fiction, no, said is the invisible default. And very often I just see writers rely so heavily on fun, colorful dialogue tags and verbs that it actually leads to their writing being a little bit ridiculous, a little bit over the top, distracting, and it can also contribute to telling. All in all, I see a lot of novice writers struggle with dialogue and scenes where people talk and how to manage those sections to improve their writing. So this is area number one where you can definitely focus and take actionable steps to improve. The first one I already mentioned, seriously, when in doubt, say, said. You don't always have to say that they shouted or they whispered they yelled, or those action tags that are often confused with dialogue tags. He smirked, he smiled, he arched a brow. I mean, we can talk about a lot of that fanficy stuff. Though, I mean, pin in that, action tags are not bad. We're gonna talk about action tags. But when in doubt, if you're not sure what to put, there's nothing wrong with putting said, or you don't always have to have a dialogue tag for a speaker. And in fact, it's going to make your writing feel much clunkier if you have he said, she said, they said, I said after every single line of dialogue. 
You have to develop your other writing skills within dialogue scenes to support dialogue and move a reader through a scene, which I'm going to talk about, so that you don't always have to say a dialogue tag to refer to who is speaking. In particular, be careful tagging with names because an overabundance of using characters' names either in the dialogue itself or in the tags can just really bog down the writing and to be distracting for your reader. And as I mentioned, avoid those flowery, over-descriptive dialogue and action tags where you're going overboard trying to describe how things are said and how characters are acting. As I mentioned, this can fall into telling territory. Territory. There's a difference between a strong action verb and telling language, and what a lot of writers fall into in dialogue, especially in fan fiction, is going overboard with describing every single thing that a character does or how they say it, and that's just as bad as not saying anything at all. But what are you supposed to do? So action tags aren't bad, and every once in a while it's not a horrible idea to describe someone smiling or smirking or laughing or arching a brow, having a reaction to someone. But it's about a balance of action and what that action does. You're balancing grounding your readers in the scene physically. Where is the character? What are they doing as they are speaking? What are they doing when someone else is speaking? And how can you use those little bits in between dialogue to remind a reader where they are, how they're feeling, and yes, a bit of how they are reacting, but you don't want to go overboard with how your character reacts because telling, or even with how other characters are acting because filtering. We're gonna talk more about those later. And actually, one tip I have for breaking things up is to sparingly but thoughtfully use internal dialogue, essentially. Especially in a first-person narrative or a close third, it can be really helpful in a dialogue scene to have little lines and cues for your reader of how your character is reacting to something without using filtering language like I think, I feel, but also without having to verbalize that. It can go a long way for voice actually to have kind of internalizations like they crack a joke to themselves, they think something sarcastic, or they express doubts for the reader's benefit only. It's about grounding your reader in two ways, physically in the space and in your characters, your POV characters, emotions and feelings and reactions to the dialogue. A go-to tip here, and a lot of places honestly in terms of judging up your writing, is to think about sensory details. Visuals are actually the most basic of sensory details to include. I actually would say you should focus more on the other senses, the way that something feels, the texture of something, the smell of something, the taste of something sound, hearing. These are sensory details that you can use to add context to a scene, to add texture to a scene, so that a reader feels like they are there and you evoke the feeling of the main character. So it's not just wall-to-wall -wall dialogue back and forth. It's not just telling the reader they're angry now. That upset them. It's finding artful ways to break up and contextualize dialogue so that your scenes are more purposeful and vivid. And some of the other sections I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you some examples of good and bad writing, including one with dialogue, so you'll hear an example of a dialogue scene that does this. So essentially, when you're going through your work, you want to look for dialogue scenes where you just have a ton of people talking back and forth, very little in between. And and you have to ask yourself, is there enough context going into this dialogue exchange? Is there enough context coming out of it? And how can I edit the actual dialogue scene so that the reader feels more grounded in that experience? When you pull it off and do it artfully, you're going to earn those moments where the dialogue stands alone and speaks for itself. Every once in a while, you earn that buh, 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 back and forth in a dialogue that just smacks the reader in the face and they don't need dialogue tags and they don't need action tags or anything else to know exactly how they should be feeling. But wall to wall dialogue, it just leaves a reader treading water in a vast ocean and they don't know what to do with it. Your book is not a play. You need all of the other aspects to ground the reader. 
Next, I'm going to talk about scene, function, and filler writing. This is another one I see all the time where writers, especially on early drafts, will just stuff their books full of scenes that don't do anything. It has cute or sweet banter, or it's going through the everyday minutia of a character's life, but it's boring. It doesn't do anything. It feels like filler. These are the number one culprits in dragging your pacing and causing readers to lose interest. This is how you bore a reader. A reader should never be in a scene and think, what is the point of this or where is this going? Every single scene in your manuscript should have a function. It should serve both the overall plot as well as character, ideally both in the same scene. Every scene should be doing a lot of work and juggling a lot of balls. And you should never have character development. So yes, you want to develop a rapport between two characters, for example, so you have your cute scene at the dinner table or at the lockers of some banter. But if that scene setting as well as that cute banter does nothing to advance the plot, it really shouldn't be in your book. Most times it's a matter of recasting that dialogue into a more effective scene or combining it with other scenes and characters and function. For any given scene, you should be asking yourself the questions of, what does my character know going into the scene? What do I need them to know in order for the next plot point to happen? And how does this scene serve that? Or alongside that, what does the reader know going into the scene? What do I need them to know to bump them along to the next plot point? Does your reader really need to see your character do their makeup or take a shower or eat a meal, have inane everyday conversation with random characters who ultimately aren't going to contribute much to the narrative? What do those interactions and scenes actually do for the reader? You know, my examples are very mundane everyday things. Most of the time when you see this, it is in the beginning of novels, and a lot of writers think they have to show you the play-by-play -play of someone's everyday life. Now, there are aspects of that play-by-play -play and status quo that can be very effective for setup in a novel, especially when your inciting incident is going to turn their entire world on its head. But it's a matter of carefully picking out details of what you're going to show and make sure that the other things happening are important. If you want to show a character getting ready and having breakfast with their family, whatever the interaction is with their family, it has to be really critical to establishing character, to character growth, to statement of theme, for setting up conflict and stakes. And it shouldn't be used for info dumping. I am going to talk more about info dumping again in the almighty telling section, but this is another kind of mistake that a lot of writers make. They go, well, I need to get all of these characters together so I can dump a bunch of backstory on the reader within the context. But whenever possible, you should be looking for active ways to reveal that information through pointed interaction or dialogue. And very often it's the scene setting itself that gives you a much more effective way to communicate information. Two characters talking by their lockers isn't going to be as dynamic or as interesting as an emergency assembly or just a regular assembly where you have a large collection of different characters, a lot of different conflicts and interactions, and maybe the principal gives a speech that conveys essential information information. That's just one dynamic example for high school specifically. It could be a party. You guys know that I love parties. And that's the thing. You should be looking for scenes and settings. The settings themselves should say something or offer conflict for your main character so that you give them something to rub up against. But always ask yourself, how much of the minutia does your reader really have to know? In that assembly example, yes, it's interesting, but do they really need to be with your character as they're walking through the hallways, entering the gym, describing every corner of the gym, walking up the bleachers, selecting their seat, observing every single person around them? Maybe if you can do that in a line or two very effectively, but I see writers do paragraphs and paragraphs and pages and pages of this drawn out 
play-by-play, -play, and that is the kind of filler you need to look for. Look for places to be really brutal with yourself and cut sometimes entire chapters if what you have is not serving a function. So I want to give you examples from my own writing where I have had to learn this lesson. I have gone to the well of group meals many times, and here's the thing, there's nothing wrong with a group meal. A group meal can be a very dynamic scene, but if you return to that well over and over again, you can stagnate. So in one of my books, I had multiple dinner parties, and they started to feel redundant. And in one particular case, I completely recast the function of the scene, the conflicts that I needed my characters to have to a brand new location. And that brand new location and the mechanics of that location introduced delicious new conflict and stakes for my characters. And by making myself rewrite it, I brought my writing and the conflict and the stakes to a whole new level. I took a dinner party scene and I recast it as a sexy game of Marco Polo in a pool. I've got my character in a bathing suit around her ex-boyfriend and her sister is flirting with him and her cousin maybe has something up her sleeve and it's way more interesting in a pool than it was around a dinner table. Another example from my latest book is my characters needed to have an emergency meeting and I had previously had one in a dorm room. And returning to that kind of tried and true location introduced pacing drag to the story. They had to kind of travel to that location, it had to be a little bit later in the day, and my editor's brilliant suggestion was where can they meet a dynamic spot where they were, where it's going to increase the tension? And so I set it in a bathroom. And if you've ever been a girl in the girl's bathroom with your friends and y'all need to have a serious conversation go down, you know the automatic kind of tone and conflict and stakes that having it in the bathroom, that having it in a public place introduces. The scene is so much better now. And in fact, in writing it, I was able to introduce new complications to it. That was the case in the pool scene as well. Just changing the scene setting and understanding the function that you need a scene to have can introduce all sorts of wonderful new dynamics. Similarly, you can think about your scenes and how they contribute to your world building. Can you have characters who need to have a conversation? And instead of having it in a static or a repetitive location, can you have them do a change of scenery? Can they go to a new location that is going to be important in the story later? One that introduces new aspects of character and world building. Can they go on a walk? Can they go in a car? In my latest project, I decided to set a conversation between my character and her grandmother in a car ride and it gave my character the opportunity to see the haves and have nots of the new town to which she moved. Now I could have had that conversation at the breakfast table and it just would not have been that interesting because the reader had already been introduced to the house and the grandma. What makes the conversation now dynamic and interesting is that it happens on the go. So always think about your scene function and what might be seen as filler, especially if you're doing blow by blow, play by play of mundane activities. So the third novice mistake I see a lot, and this is when writers write a lot of words and they write a lot of long-ish sentences and even long paragraphs and they're saying very little. I guess this kind of also speaks to filler, but I mean also on the solo line level as well. It's overly complex, repetitive, meandering sentences. They're a pain to read. They're frustrating, especially when you as the reader realize, well, you already said that, or worse, that doesn't mean what you think it means. It's always best to be clear and concise in your writing. Very often I actually see this with writers who are trying really hard to be evocative in their writing, to be descriptive in their writing, show, don't tell. Well, the dark side of show, don't tell is using so many words and phrases and clauses that you actually obfuscate what you're trying to say, and you don't sound smarter or better at writing, you just look a little bit confused. And it doesn't make for a very pleasant reading experience, and readers are more likely to nope out of your writing because it does start to feel like filler. 
One example that I came up with was the summer shower sprinkles lightly against my skin as it rains. So a shower generally is already inferred to be a light rain, so you don't have to say sprinkles lightly. Summer shower more than effectively communicates what it is. Similarly, ending that sentence with as it rains, again, you already said it was raining, and in fact, you were descriptive with your first three words of what kind of rain it was. Now, the against the skin part, this could be interesting, but you can go further. How does it feel against your skin? Can you think about temperature? Or, honestly, does it even matter? Could you simply say, it's raining? <laughs> Does the summer shower matter at all? These are the things to consider. Are you adding details and descriptions and kind of meandering sentences because you think that you need to be more descriptive? Be very precise about what you're writing and why. It's far more effective that the summer shower reminds the character of when they were a child and it brings up feelings or the summer shower soaks them and that adds complications to the narrative. There should always be function to the things that you are describing, but also just on a sentence level, that was not a good sentence. I purposely wrote a very bad sentence, but I see a lot of writing that has a lot of sentences like that. They look like they're saying a lot and they ultimately say nothing. Similarly, what I have seen is the unnecessary use of past perfect. And I, I know that's like really specific, but I legitimately do see this a lot in novice writing. It's adding an extra had, past tense, past perfect verb to sentences just because. It just adds an additional layer of complication to the writing that is not necessary most of the time. So the example that I have, yes, this is based on a real thing, but I, I changed the details to protect the guilty. My mother had always said gardening was the root of happiness. I saw something like this as an opening line for a book. And the first thing I thought was, you know, that would be a much cleaner sentence if you eliminated literally just one word. Just one word makes it a cleaner sentence. And that alternative that is much better, more direct, is my mother always said gardening was the root of happiness. Direct and effective. But there are also other ways to tackle similar ideas. I do want you to think about varying your sentence structure, varying your style. In the next section, I'm actually gonna talk all about varying your sentence style, but I did do an example of this where you do something just a little bit different, a little bit voicey, using the same idea. Gardening is the root of happiness. That's what my mama always said. Another aspect of sentences that seem to say a lot but say very little. Yeah, we're going to talk about filtering language. Again, this is going to come up in telling as well. And in fact, get ready, I'm gonna make an entire video on filtering, it is time. Filtering is when you filter the reader's experience of something through the point of view of your main character. Filtering is, of course, a very natural part, particularly of first-person writing, but the thing about filter words is that they do weaken your writing. So the sentences that are going to feel clunky and weighed down, these are the ones that are going to start with, I feel, I see, I hear, I sense, things like that. You're adding a dimension to the sentence that just gives it an extra weight when you could simply say, instead of, I hear a branch crack in the woods, a branch cracks to my right. It's your opportunity to be more direct, more active, and just more exciting. Another thing in terms of sentences to say a lot, but say very little, I see a lot of writers use weak verbs and repetitive constructions. And what you want to do here is use more complex, strong, specific verbs to basically say the same thing, but honestly, better, shorter, and sweeter. So an example of this that I came up with was, I walk home so fast that I practically run. Much stronger would be something like, I race 
home. Race as a verb, it just has this connotation of tension to it that is much better than I walk so fast, I practically run. And also using something short and sweet and direct like I race home gives you the opportunity to add more effective description to this. Maybe you do tack on something like I race home tripping over my shoelaces more than once, or they scrape their knee, or they ignore the buzzing of their cell phone in their pocket. Basically by using more direct, specific, exciting verbs, you tighten up your language, but also introduce new opportunities to have more effective description. Again, that the dark side of show don't tell is it really depends on what you are showing. Not all details and descriptions are created equal and you can indeed end up having tons of imagery technically in your book, but it's filler imagery. It's imagery and description that doesn't actually do anything in terms of character or pacing or suspense. So another thing to look for with kind of the long meandering sentences that don't do much is sloppy grammar. Sloppy grammar, but also kind of, I'll call it lazy grammar and usage. And I do this by the way, but I've also had to really take myself to task in my writing of doing it less often. And that is relying on tons of commas. I love commas. Look for spots where you're doing long sentences with lots of commas, uh, M dashes, ellipses. Again, I love these things, but you'd be amazed how looking for more direct ways to have a series of sentences or phrases or clauses, it's just in many cases going to be more effective writing. It's literally easier for the reader's eye to move over a series of short, concise, specific and direct sentences than it is to move through a long meandering sentence with a ton of semicolons and commas and M dashes and ellipses and asides. Oh, I had a huge problem with asides for a long time. That's when you put things in parentheses. And when you look for ways to eliminate those and clean up your writing, First of all, it's gonna help your writing style and varying your sentence structure, which is the next section. But also it gives you license to use those things, those stylistic things much more effectively when you do use them. I still love a well-applied M dash or a side or ellipses, but I use them sparingly. So this is one of those things where I challenge you to look for these crutches in your own writing and you don't have to get rid of all of them, but take it one scene at a time. Challenge yourself to change every instance in one scene or half of them in the entire project. It's a great way to start once you identify these things that you're doing repeatedly so that you can basically start training yourself to write better. And last but certainly not least, it kind of falls under the umbrella of all the rest of the stuff, but I just want to give a special shout out to my friends out there who use tons of purple prose that basically renders your sentence completely meaningless. <laughs> I mostly see this in either fantasy or literary writing, and I just want to put it out there as a warning. You look super novice when essentially you don't quite understand how the words that you're choosing actually work, especially within more complex grammatical constructions. I've just seen completely nonsensical writing that definitely looks and sounds pretty, but ultimately is meaningless. I've actually seen this in some published books, but regardless, I consider it to be a real amateur mistake to use big fancy words and overworked metaphors because you think it sounds literary and smart. Truly smart, talented writers understand what words mean and know how to use them in a sentence. It's just a warning to be careful if your writing style does tend to be kind of flowery and descriptive. Be aware of those kind of pitfalls of the dark side of show, don't tell. It's about what you're choosing to show, but also the literal meaning of the words. You can also definitely go overboard on stylistic writing, like using gerunds and clauses and phrases. You can basically go so overboard on style that it renders your writing gobbledygook. So the fourth section I'll move through pretty quickly. It is the cousin to the third one. And this is specifically repetitive 
sentence style, repetitive basic sentence style. And this is a novice mistake I see all the time in first person writing specifically. So that's definitely what I am going to focus on. But bear this section in mind with the third one. Very likely if you have a problem with number three or vice versa, if you have a problem with number four, you probably have a problem with the other one as well. This is essentially a problem where almost all of your sentences, and certainly I'll notice it with paragraphs, I'll skim over a page, and if every single paragraph starts the same way, it starts to blur together, and that's the I verb construction. Over and over and over again in first person writing, I do this, I do that, I say, I speak. It's a huge pitfall of first person, which is simultaneously, I think, both the easiest and the hardest point of view for writers to write in. It's the easiest because we're all the first person <laughs> narrative of our own lives and stories, but accordingly, I see a lot of writers fall into the pattern of, well, I'll just say I blank over and over and over again, because that's how you write first person. That's how you write first person poorly. The challenge in first person is to find varying sentence styles and varying sentence structure so that your reading feels fresh and dynamic, so the reader doesn't feel like they're reading the same sentence and sentence construction over and over and over again. And again, I'm gonna go over it in the telling section, but this definitely contributes to the problem of a book feeling like it is wall-to-wall -wall telling, partly because a lot of these I verb constructions are also using filtering. By using it over and over again, you're automatically filtering everything through that lens of your main character, and that just adds distance to the writing. So some tips on fixing this, you just have to try a lot harder not to start all of your sentences with I and blank. So how do you begin to tackle this? Honestly, looking at your use of filter words is a big one. You need to look for all of those places where you're saying, I feel, I think, I see, I hear, and so on. All you have to do is knock that filtering off and already you're going to have a sentence that isn't going to start with I in a verb. It's going to be a stronger, more direct sentence, and you can pepper those in between your I statements. You're not getting rid of I statements. It's first person. You have to have them. You also have to have filtering. Filtering itself doesn't have to be evil, but too much filtering bogs down work. Another thing you can do, and this is actually going to help you to develop writing style and voice, you don't always have to write incomplete sentences. I know that you're like, what? <laughs> now you do, of course, have to learn kind of the rules to break them, but there are a lot of writers who do fantastic stylistic writing where they're going to use incomplete clauses and phrases. And I love sentences that start with gerunds for style. That's really fun. Usually gerunds are used as like in a series of lists and it's like a building onto something to describe something. And a writer who does this really, really well is actually Rory Power. I noticed the style in her writing and I mean, I eat it up, but I want to give you an example. And you'll see that it's descriptive and specific and evocative first person, and it has a lot of voice. Breakfast wasn't much, and I'm feeling the shake of hunger in my limbs. I know by it is too, so we're quick as we head downstairs for lunch to the main floor, to the hall, with its big high ceilings. Look at the repeat of that to the, to the, in describing. That's good writing. Scarred, tilting tables, a fireplace, and tall backed couches, stuffing ripped out to burn for warmth. That's technically not a complete sentence. I mean, it is, you know the rules to break them. But think about what that's doing, how evocative it is. It's very descriptive, but it doesn't have a subject and a verb. And the final sentence, which I love. And us, full of us, humming and alive. And I'll also give you an example from my own writing. I can't hold a candle to worry, but just a bit of writing that includes both an I verb sentence, but is followed by something else. I blink slowly, shake my head as if to clear it, because I must have misheard. That is actually part of a dialogue scene, so that's a good example bringing it back to the first one. That's something that you can insert between dialogue. It tells you what the character is doing and it gives you a sense of what they are thinking, how they are reacting to something that's been said. 
Here is another example I pulled out from my own work from the Ivies of kind of playing around with incomplete sentences essentially to kind of fill something with description and voice without resulting to a series of telling I phrases. But I would never dare be so glib. Not today. The phone rings, shredding already delicate nerves, and I jump into action. Yes, we understand you are upset. No, you cannot speak to the headmistress at this time. Kill them with kindness, but remain firm. Promise to take down the details and head Mistress Fitzgerald will give them top priority as soon as possible. I'm literally describing something that's happening, but I'm also giving you a sense of kind of protocol, the tenseness of my main character's feelings about these things. And in the writing itself, I used italics for the things that were inferring things that she said to parents on the phone. I didn't break into dialogue for that as it would really kind of ruin the flow of the paragraph. And that, by the way, is how I described hours of a character doing something in the story in a single paragraph. So lastly is an example that I mentioned with dialogue. And again, this is an example of there are I constructions, but you're also making clear direct statements which reflect observations, which describe things, which move a reader through a scene without resorting to the same sentence structure over and over again. So the first speaker is my main character, Olivia. Hey, Rebecca, good game. She narrows her eyes at me. What do you want, Olivia? I concede, offering a pathetic grimace. Behind me, Diana screams at Nisha, who just launched a shell at her. Can we, um, I direct her over to the windows, away from the Mario madness on the couch. But once we are reasonably ensconced in the corner, my mind goes blank. I don't know how to start. I offer these examples not because I'm the end-all be-all of writing, but because I feel weird using other people's writing as examples, though obviously I pulled out Rory's. But these are just examples to kind of get your mind ticking over. If you find in your writing that you are returning to that well of I go, I do, I see over and over and over again, that repetitiveness in your sentence structure and writing, that is a barrier between you and your story and the reading. And part of leveling up your writing is thinking of other ways to position your sentences, to describe things, to move characters through a scene. And through this, you're not only going to improve your writing, this is how you develop writing style and voice. I will say, you don't have to be running at 100% in every single scene of your book, every single sentence, but it's about artfully tackling in revision, select scenes, select chapters, and like really polishing up that writing to a shine so that you can have sections where maybe that was a day that you, it, it matters a little less the perfect execution of that scene so you can get a little lazy in some parts of your book. The problem is when 80, 90% of your book is that kind of amateurish writing, you're not able to skate by. Okay, all of this brings me to the big one, which is telling. Telling is the worst. As I said, this is the number one thing that is standing between you as an amateur writer and being better at writing. And I'm speaking to you as someone who has struggled with telling my whole life. I've been actively working on my telling issues for a very long time, decades. And as you know, if you watch some of my previous videos, I'm not here to tell you if you write in a telling style that you're garbage and you have to show and be descriptive and be lyrical. I'm not that kind of writer and you don't have to be that kind of writer. The key is to work actively on different aspects of telling that do put that distance into the writing, that do stop readers from connecting with your stories. You just have to target some of these specific areas, some of which I've already gone over, and do your best over time to level up your craft. So I'll try to move through this quickly. Some of this is kind of covered in the other sections because telling is basically like the big granddaddy that sits over most amateur writing mistakes or a large number of amateur writing mistakes. And so the first one is that filler. It is that blow by blow and very often within that it is that repetitive sentence structure. I do this, I do that, or if you're in third person, she does this, she does that. So instead of writing like this, think about that varying your sentence structure that I mentioned and think about those examples. You're finding ways to move a character through a scene, to move a reader through a scene, and to have meaningful, interesting, 
active interactions that perform that work. So instead of a blow by blow of a character moving through a space or through an action, you can have a few sentences describing it, but then what if someone interrupts them? A character comes along and asks them a question or gets in their face, and you can actually use those character interruptions. I had this as a writing hack at one point. I called it introduce an interruption, and that's basically what it is. You're using a brief, active, dramatic scene, narration versus dramatization, another thing I'm going to link to down below, to demonstrate something instead of relying on that more passive narration. The difference I see between the issue of wall-to-wall -wall telling in an amateur writer and a writer who is more experienced is the amateur writer never effectively dramatizes or very rarely effectively dramatizes, and that's what you have to work on. It's drastically reducing the amount of telling you're doing and looking for artful places to have dramatization and conflict and active things happening. So the example that I came up with, imagine two sisters sitting on the couch. Marcy tells me to change the channel. I stick my tongue out and try to find something we both like. There's not actually anything fundamentally wrong with that, and depending on where that fell in a scene, those two sentences could be completely fine, especially if it came after a really detailed and active scene, or if it directly precedes an active scene. But I challenged myself to rewrite it in a more active and dramatic way using dialogue. Keep your toes to yourself, Marcy. I wriggle out of her toe range. They're cold to boot. You have the remote, change the channel. She digs her wiggly ass toes into my ribs again. Fine, I grit out. No reality bullshit, Marcy dictates with a triumphant spurk. Little fanfic -y, but forgive me. <laughs> Effing sisters. In the actual text, I would use the F word. But that's a combination in my writing style, of course, of kind of the specific actions that are happening. You can feel the sisters annoyance with each other without necessarily having to say it. And I have the main character having kind of snarky asides to kind of communicate her personality and their relationship. If I continued writing this scene, I'd have something about how they really love each other. And it would definitely be part of a scene specifically contributing to the main thrust of the plot. So the next big thing in telling is info dumping huge, huge issue that amateur writers have. And I mean, it takes time to learn how to effectively communicate backstory, context, etc. in fiction in an effective way. It takes practice. But the way you don't want to do it <laughs> is every time you meet a new character, as soon as they appear on the page, your main character goes into two or three paragraphs about their whole backstory, or about exactly how they feel about that character. Or even worse, I do see writers do this where I can tell they've constructed an entire scene, remember that scene function thing, just to dump some backstory about some characters. Sometimes, yes, you are going to construct a scene in order to essentially introduce characters and backstory, but not for an info dump, I beg you. Not for an info dump. You have to trust your readers. The beginning of a book especially, they're along for the ride with you, and it's about dropping in nuggets breadcrumbs of context and backstory. Sure, when you first meet someone, of course you're going to have to have some sort of context or backstory, but instead of a few paragraphs about the entire history of how they met, do a nugget. It could be a specific anecdote, maybe about how they met, but it could just be something that really characterizes their relationship with each other. It could even feel a little flashbacky. This is actually something that I did in The Ivies. I inserted a flashback, essentially, of the first time my character Olivia met the character Emma, and it's just a brief little exchange. It actually involves a third character, who's ultimately not important to the story, saying something nasty to my character, and Emma swoops in, and well, she's nasty back, but she basically saves my character from the situation. It's incredibly important context and backstory, though interestingly added in my last revision. It tells you a lot about Olivia as a character, it tells you about what the school is like, and it tells you a lot about Emma. And it adds layers to Emma because she saves someone by being vicious. And that's definitely an aspect of the character that I wanted to highlight. So it's how you choose to kind of add context and backstory. And that's just one way to do it. 
Another thing you can definitely do, this is great for antagonistic characters or characters where there's a complex backstory. This is essentially a suspense technique, but you can use it in any kind of fiction. Let's say your character runs into their ex. You don't need to dump the entire story of their relationship, why they broke up, etc. Frankly, for most readers, there's a shorthand simply by saying, they're my ex, but you can maybe put in a little detail. It could be an echo of the last thing that person said to them when they broke up. It could be an echo of something good followed by the sourness of them sneering at them in the present. You can highlight little details that definitely give your reader the sense that something's up. And then you save the reveal of those more important details, salient details for later. You can have them come out in an argument, a confrontation, and this is all saving you from having big dumps of information in paragraphs. Or even using the example of my two sisters, if that was a real scene in a book, that interaction could lead you into a short but sweet paragraph that contextualizes the sister relationship. It doesn't give you all the blow by blow details, but you've just seen a colorful scene of how they interact with each other. So a short but sweet paragraph of background slash context, it goes down like butter. How you transition into the information both in and out is very important. So the next big thing I find as a problem in telling is the consistent and constant use of passive sentence constructions. Brush up on passive voice what it is, passive verbs, and look in your writing for passive writing constructions. Passive voice by its very nature adds distance to the writing. So when a writer, in addition to all these other kind of telling things, is also relying on a ton of passive voice, it's just that distance. And when I feel very distanced by a story over and over and over again through all of the various traps you can fall into with telling, it's just a turnoff. But passive voice in particular just kind of irks me, it gets under my skin, and makes me mad. The next thing I mentioned in the dialogue section, yeah, it's those dialogue tags and action tags that are essentially telling. It's verbs and descriptions and also the dreaded adverbs. How have I gotten this far into the video without mentioning adverbs? Very often in those tags, it's using adverbs to describe how they're doing things. Adjectives can do this as well, but adverbs are the culprit. Again, I'm never going to tell you not to use adverbs. I love adverbs, but you do need to pay attention to how often you modify your descriptions to tell the reader exactly how something is being said or done or how something looks. And when you say how something looks, you're filtering, uh, which is the next thing. So we'll just talk about filtering. Really examine what you're saying and how. Are you filtering a ton of your statements? Are you telling them exactly how to feel about something by repeatedly doing things like saying she laughed or she chuckled or she looked upon him with scorn? For example, all of these are fine in moderation, but I find a lot with amateur writers who have problems with telling that they go to that well over and over and over again in the name of descriptive writing, honestly. It's deceptive. You think you're showing because you're describing something, but you're actually telling. Telling is, is truly an Achilles heel, and as I mentioned, I share it. And so I'll end, since I've talked about most of the things I want to talk about with the best you can do is the best you can do. I hope this video and me rambling on for far too long about five major pitfalls that I just see amateur writers make over and over again, and usually in conjunction, because all of these are basically cousins to each other and telling is their, their granddaddy. I like that. <laughs> I'm gonna use that from now on. Telling is the granddaddy of amateur writing mistakes, and you have all these things under it. That they kind of work together. It's overwhelming if you go, I'm a bad writer, I have to fix it. But it's manageable and actionable if you take even one of the things on this list that you're positive that you do and you work to fix it. You look to identify it in your writing and then you just go line by line, word by word, and you do revision. It's swapping out one word for another word. It's taking a sentence or the, the gist of a whole paragraph. Let's say you're like, I think I just used 100 words to describe something that could be done in a one really effective sentence or maybe two. It's doing that work. And I'll tell you, when I do this, I still do it now and I've been doing it for years and this is the slow, steady process of leveling up. Y you can spend an hour <laughs> 
you can spend an hour on a particularly tricky description. But of course, as you do it more, it does come more naturally. And you can take a scene. Let's say you have a scene and you know that you have a ton of repetitive I statements. You think you're maybe kind of chewing on the scenery too much. You're over describing the wrong things. Maybe you got some filtering language going on. Just rewrite that scene. Read it over. If you have Scrivener, you can do this with Word too. I like to have the original in one window and a blank on the other side. And I'll go back and forth and I'll just challenge myself line by line, paragraph by paragraph, idea by idea. It's ultimately ideas. What are you trying to communicate in this scene? And you try writing it again. You try writing it differently. And slowly but surely over time, you will get better. But you're also not alone. Well, ultimately, you do have to identify this in your own writing and self-editing. Really, only you can do this. You also have critique partners. Look for critique partners who are willing to actually give you this feedback, who are willing to go through maybe a scene or a chapter and line edit for you. Really line edit. You have to tell them, be brutal with me, and you have to mean it. Uh, it's amazing how another writer or an editor, I've learned so much from my editors, just going through and pointing out, well, you could say it this way, or this isn't this, as strong a word as it could be. It's like mind blowing. And sometimes you do need someone else to help you out. So seek out critique partners. If your current critique partners, if they're kind of at the same level of, of writing as you, sometimes you do have to kind of go a level up and tell them to be brutally honest with you, but you actually have to mean it. Do a sample chapter and, and see what you get from it. Slowly but surely, I promise you, you can root out these individual things and level up and get better. Let me know down below in the comments if you have any questions about any of these things that I've talked about. I made this video because I realized I make all of these kind of, well, these are problems in writing, these are concepts in writing, but I wanted to try to make something that was a little bit more concrete that might actually help you kind of dig into your writing. I can't line edit all of your manuscripts if I could. I'm honestly not detail oriented to be good at line editing, <laughs> but there's so much value in kind of staring your writing straight in the face and its potential pitfalls, especially telling, always telling and really trying to make the change. Give this video a thumbs up if you like it and I will make more pointed craft type videos. As always guys, thank you so much for watching and happy writing.